very important instruction in the very first letter that Srila Prabhupada ever gave me, or wrote to me, where he was so amazed at this first Christmas marathon, and I could hardly believe 17,000 books in three days from one temple, and he wrote throughout this letter about how important this is to distribute books. And then I came to the very last sentence of the letter where Prabhupada wrote, but more important still, I mean, the whole letter was about saving others, but more important still is save yourself. So I said, Srila Prabhupada, before I met you, I was crazy. And now I'm not crazy. He said, no, you are not crazy. Your brother, Madhu Mangal, he is crazy. <laughs> I was the first widow in the movement, the first widow in ISKCON. And because of that, I was called in for a personal darshan with Srila Prabhupada. Now, I'll have to give some background information for it to make sense. Okay, I joined the movement in my teens with my younger brother, got married after eight months, uh, opened different temples with my then husband and had a daughter. Then he fell away from devotional service, left the movement, and then left his body. Um, I wanted to know what I was, if I was prohibited to ever remarry and have more children. My daughter was about two years old. I was just in my low 20s. I didn't know, you know what was expected of me, so I asked. So after several days, actually, nobody wanted to be the person who told Srila Prabhupada what happened. But finally, his servant, who was Sri Kirti at the time, did tell Srila Prabhupada and also said that the widow wants to remarry, So, which didn't look very good for me. But before I knew it, I was called in for a darshan in Srila Prabhupada's quarters. So I was terrified. I said, I'm not going. So my brother said, I'll go with you. I'll go with you. And we formulated a plan while running around uh, finding a babysitter for Nimai and running around getting ready to go up to his quarters. And the plan was that if things were looking bleak for me, I would give him a nudge or a sign and he would explain to Srila Prabhupada, my sister feels like she needs to remarry for protection. This was our plan. Like we were thinking that we could control the situation, possibly manipulate. So we go running upstairs and before we even got into his quarters, this is in Los Angeles, his quarters, we were in the doorway and I heard Prabhupada say, so you wish to remarry? I was terrified. I said in a voice I could barely recognize, I said, not right away, Srila Prabhupada. I just wanted to know if I would be forbidden. And he said, forbidden? I will not forbid, I will not forbid you, but you are asking my opinion. What could I say to that? No thanks, I'll pass. I said, yes, Srila Prabhupada. He said, don't do it. And by this time we all sat down. It was myself, my brother, and Sri Kirti. We were alone in his quarters. He began to say, what is your guarantee the next one will be different? In this age, the women are entrained in chastity, the men are entrained in dharma. What is your guarantee the next one will be different? Can he give you a written guarantee? He was making jokes. He said, Krishna has already given you one child. Marriage is for union. For children, you already have one child. Give all your love to that child. And he, he said a lot of other things that I don't remember exactly everything. But I remember at some point, I must have given my brother the nudge because he said, Srila Prabhupada, my sister feels like she needs to remarry for protection. And Prabhupada's guys got, his eyes got really big and he said, you are not protected to me. You are not protected to my brother. You are not protected to Shruti Kirti. He said, just see, there is no faith. And he went on to explain how in relation to Krishna, we're all Prakriti. Krishna is the only Purusha, we're all Prakriti, that a man cannot actually protect his wife. He can't protect her from disease, from old age, from death. Only Krishna is our only protection. 
he was speaking rather, he was speaking the philosophy. It was a little lofty because we were new devotees. I could see in the eyes of the other two, it was like, whoa. And um, this is what he was saying to us. And um, let me think. Then my brother recited some Sanskrit. And he said, Srila Prabhupada, I will protect her. I am, her. I am her brother. And Prabhupada said, very nice. And during this time, I, I really didn't look up much because I was so terrified. I kind of looked down. I looked up once. And I just remember he was sitting behind his desk and the sun was shining in the window and his beautiful round soft head was effulgent and golden and his voice was like coming from ages. And I just thought, I felt like a fly. I felt so insignificant and soiled. I was just absolutely terrified. So he didn't say much to me because I didn't look up. But as we were leaving, he said something and all three of us turned around. And then Prabhupada only looked at me and only spoke to me and he said, read the books. I have, I have written so many books. All day long I read, I write, I chant, I take bath. You do like this. And he said it with such compassion and love. And I said, yes, Srila Prabhupada. And that was the end of it. We walked down the stairs. Okay, this, this is another in New Vrindavan, evening darshan. And um, Srila Prabhupada looked in this uh, Mataji Gopa, who lives in Nuvrindav, and she was, you know, just there in her sari, and it was a little, you know, chilly in the evening. And Srila Prabhupada asked her, he said, you know, are you okay? Are you warm enough? And she was like, you know, so shy, she, she didn't say anything. And then Kaladri started to say, well, um, she's just happy to be here, Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, no. He said, you should... Make sure that these women are taken care of. He said you should ask at least once a month if they need anything. And you have to make sure that you're protecting them and that you take care of them. And, you know, it was just another example how Prabhupada was very concerned and compassionate. They, you know, we were taking care of the, the woman and, made, you know, making sure that they had everything. He even said uh, at that time, he said, you know, they're, they're shy, they won't ask, so you have to make sure and ask and uh, make sure that they have everything they need. He started talking about sannyas, so I asked him if I could take sannyas, and he said, yes, you may take sannyas when you have no sex desire. <laughs> you can always say no in the, in the most gentle fashion. I remember another thing that Srila Prabhupada told me during that time that's very important. He talked about the coming of unemployment in the Kali Yuga. Now, what we're seeing in this now, this is, this is um, 2009, almost 2010. It's a bad economic time. But Prabhupada was talking that as the Kali Yuga progresses, more and more there will be unemployment. And Prabhupada said, it is, we must be ready to take these unemployed people into our movement on our farms. That's what Prabhupada said, that we need farm communities that can grow food. Because, and he predicted this, that one day millions of people will be coming to our Hare Krishna farms because they're unemployed and we must accept them. We must feed them. We must let them live there and they will gradually become spiritualized. We'll put them to work, they will get their food, it will be prasadam, they will hear something about Krishna and they will gradually, by the millions, become devotees. This is Prabhupada's prediction about Kali Yuga and unemployment and the Krishna conscious farm communities. Amazing prediction and vision. He started to walk out of the palace and uh, Bali Mardan was there and, and he said, oh, Srila Prabhupada, you know, it says in the Krishna book that, that Krishna's palaces in Dwarka, they were illuminated with the jewels on the wall. And Prabhupada stopped and he lifted his cane and he waved it at the devotees that were there and he said these devotees are my jewels <laughs>
to you. 